Introduction to Freud's Theory of Personality Part 1, Viennese Influences Dr. Michael Botwin, Department of Psychology, California State University, Fresno As psychologists, we most often have to deal with the fact that outsiders think that most psychology has to do with Freud. As you've learned over the years of being a psychology major, you know that very little modern work is inspired by Freudian research. In fact, Freudian research is kind of an anomaly because Freud, face it, didn't do a lot of research. He worked exclusively in case study methods and kind of came up with stuff almost on his own. I'm not going to say entirely on his own. I believe that every student of psychology should be well versed in Freud. Not that you're ever going to use it, but you need to be able to talk about Freud to all those non-psychologists who come along and want to know why you are uh, going to analyze them or are you going to analyze them when you're having an encounter with someone for the first time. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that over the years as a psychologist. Uh, and I've learned to load the, are you analyzing me, kind of statement. I have one defense mechanism to pick on Freud's works to defray that. I usually introduce myself as a research psychologist which usually shuts people up, but if it doesn't, then I get to tell them about the work I'm doing and the work that my students are doing in our lab, which to me is great because I love talking about the things we're doing. And then since the question was asked, you have a nice little captive audience. Freud has influenced much of Western culture and he still has a strong place in literature. In fact, there's a major movement in literary circles to do literary analysis from a Freudian perspective. Whether that does any good or not, I'm not quite certain about. But we need to have some understanding of Freud. Now, most likely up to this point, you've looked at Freud and you've been taught Freud as a series of stages and a bunch of tinker toyed parts in the psyche that kind of run around and bash each other, kind of like an old Three Stooges comedy. Although I'm not a Freudian, I think it's important that you develop an appreciation for Freud. And Freud is largely taught incorrectly. So over the next seven parts, I'm going to give you a different perspective on Freud, possibly a more comprehensive and in-depth one than you previously had. The first part of this discussion is going to take place around the work that Freud did in Vienna in the early 1900s. And I'm primarily going to talk about what was going on in early 1900s Vienna, Austria. This is really important because a lot of the notions that Freud had were highly influenced by intellectual developments during that time and in that specific location. In fact, a lot of people have the misunderstood uh, idea that Freud sat around in a small room coming up with all of these weird ideas about sex and aggression. And frankly, he did come up with some weird ideas about sex and aggression, but he didn't do it in a vacuum. He did it in an intellectual environment that was blossoming in early 20th century Vienna. So the first part of our presentation, we're going to look at 
early modernist Vienna, and then we're going to look at some of Freud's early influences. Hope you enjoy. Eric Kandel is a Nobel Prize winning neuroscientist, and he's fascinated with the work of the Austrian painter Gustav Klimt. And he wrote a book recently called The Age of Insight. The first part of that book really gave me an epiphany of what Freud was thinking about when he came up with many of his ideas, which is exactly what Kendall wanted to do. He explored the intellectual environment in early 20th century Vienna, especially those things that influenced Sigmund Freud. One of the things he discusses in this book is the relationship between art, the brain, and psychoanalysis, with commas, somehow those got missing there. And he makes these statements about Vienna circa 1900. First, there were great advances and strides in the arts and literature that paralleled those in science and medicine. Uh, this is one of Klimt's paintings here. Actually, all of these are Klimt's paintings. This one is uh, of a woman that he calls Hygienia. And it was from something called the Beethoven Frieze, which uh, was in a Viennese medical school. However, it was thought to be too provocative by the conservative administrators of the institution, and unfortunately they painted it over. Uh, fortunately for us, some of the images still survive. The thing is, scientists and artists interacted freely during this time. Uh, as an academician, one of the things I lament is we kind of get stuck in what's been known as our silos. Uh, I'm in the psychology department silo. My colleagues in the art department are doing their things over there. And we're so busy, we rarely ever get together. But there was a big social push for artists and scientists to hang out together during this time. Also, there was a great interest intellectually in human sexuality. Now, people have always been interested in sex, that's not a big deal, but people were trying to figure out sexuality, some exploring it through science, others through artistic expression, like Klimt. Here is a Klimt painting uh, that shows many, many things. Uh, highly sexual. This comes from the Beethoven Frieze. Now, Kandel says that Viennese modernism was marked by three things. First of all, the mind was seen as an irrational structure. And there were unconscious conflicts that are present for everyone in everyday life. Now, when you think of Freud, you think of the unconscious and you think of conflicts. So this was a far more common thing than we usually think about. The conscious, unconscious, excuse me, also consists of erotic feelings and unconscious aggressive impulses and how they were aimed at both the self and others. So you can see that this was a common thread running through Vienna, not just Freud's mind. Another one of the three characteristics of Viennese modernism was a quest for the rules that govern individuality. What makes me different than you? This is basically the substance of my field, personality psychology. Finally, uh, the third point is that Viennese modernists looked at outward appearances and how they were affected by inner private thoughts and feelings. 
and you can see where Freud got some of his influences from his ideas there, especially those about dreams. Also, in terms of characteristics of Viennese modernism, self-analysis was very important. In fact, a keystone or hallmark of psychoanalysis is that a psychoanalyst has to be analyzed before they can analyze other people. So, to recap this in modernist Vienna, there is an open dialogue between the biological sciences, psychology, literature, and art. It had to be a fascinating intellectual environment. Freud's early mentors, Bruck, Brewer, and Charcot. Ernst Wilhelm von Bruck was an early neurophysiologist, and he developed the idea that all living things are dynamic and based on the laws of chemistry and physics. Okay, move slide. And he investigated the effects of electricity and muscles. He was one of Freud's earliest intellectual influences, uh, and he largely inspired Freud's work. In fact, Freud's first published research was on the nervous system of the salamander and looking at how electricity flows through salamander neurons. Why salamanders? Well, it wasn't that Freud was looking to develop a slimy theory, it's just that salamanders had large neurons, and in the early 20th century, late 19th century, uh, with the medical tools of the time, it was easy to examine salamander neurons. His other influence was Joseph Brewer. Brewer did some very influential work on the nervous system and how we do things. He's responsible for finding the vagus nerve that's responsible for respiration. He did this with another famous uh, early physiologist, Herring. With Ernst Mach, he discovered that human balance is related to fluid in the semicircular canals of the ears. And that's something that we still hold as a fact. Important stuff. He also was one of the first ones to use talking therapies in clinical work. And his early work was dedicated to curing women of hysteria, which was then thought to be a disease that only women had because it was a disease of the hymen. And since men do not have hymens, it would have been impossible for a man to be hysterical. We've learned that one's false. And he worked with Freud on one of the first published case studies on mental illness, uh, the case, famous case of Anna O, who was a woman that had lots of clinical issues. Uh, her real name was Bertha Pappenham. And she is the first woman to experience the use of what was to become psychoanalysis. It's a fascinating story, although she, uh, her problems go beyond the scope of our basic personality class. Freud, as you know, also worked with the Frenchman Charcot and after spending some time in Vienna, which was his home base, he spent some time in France with Charcot. Now, Charcot was finding great success in studying women who were, as Charcot said, hysterical. Uh, this is a famous picture of Charcot treating a hysterical woman. He used hypnosis as a form of relaxation to cure women of hysteria. 
I have an interesting idea. Uh, historically, uh, hysteria was a disorder common to upper middle class European women. And historians of science have gone back to say one of the main reasons that women suffered from this hysteria, uh, which may sound sexist, but it's the result of sexism, was wearing these well bone corsets that were popular with the upper class women. Basically, they cut off the ability to breathe very well, and when a woman got excited, she couldn't get enough oxygen and she fainted. Uh, you may remember seeing movies about early 20th century uh, world where women are always fainting. Uh, this was supposedly hysteria. Now, Freud himself, uh, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about Freud in terms of his biography. He was born in 1856 in a place called Moravia, which is now someplace in Czechoslovakia. At the time, it was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. He spent most of his life from childhood on in Vienna. However, uh, due to Nazi aggression, he moved to London and died in 1939. Now, to give Freud some credit, uh, Freud was going to stay and work against the Nazi regime. Uh, as you know, Freud was Jewish, and Freud didn't leave Vienna until the Nazis started threatening members of his family. And I guess it's one thing to deal with threats against your life. It's another thing to deal with threats against your family. Freud moved to London, uh, spent the last few years of his life in extreme pain. You all know the old notion about Freud that you rarely see him pictured without a cigar. One of his favorite statements on non-clinical things is, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. But Freud also, early in his medical career, attempted to use cocaine as a tool for psychotherapy. After his closest colleague, Wilhelm Fleiss, died of an overdose of cocaine, Freud discontinued the practice of using cocaine therapeutically. However, he did continue using it for personal use. Now, his favorite form of ingesting cocaine was to do it as a liquid. He mixed the powdered cocaine with a liquid, which wasn't illegal at the time, and would take what he called a cocaine cocktail. Uh, you can imagine the devastation uh, on his mouth and throat between the cigars and the effects of cocaine. Freud eventually developed cancer of the mouth, and he was in extreme pain during the last years of his life. Uh, his lower jaw was held to his face by a prosthesis. So, when a certain time came, he made an agreement with his medical doctor when he came to the pain that he could stand no more. Uh, his doctor would administer a massive dose of barbiturates, and Freud would uh, go to sleep and not wake up, which is exactly what happened. Freud lived in what was the end of the Victorian era, and this comes out in his theories. Uh, especially about men and women, and family life. The father was essentially the master and commander of the family. Uh, the wife was second in charge, and the children were all subservient. Uh, male domination comes up in his theories and was one of the primary things he was criticized for. 
So we have this Victorian era rigid structure, a lot of sexual repression. And it was a time where there was a lot of anti-Semitism, even before the Nazis came around. In fact, Freud's earliest career aspirations was to be a university professor. However, there was a quota on university professors for Jews. And many young Jewish intellectuals went into medicine instead of academia because they couldn't deal with the prejudice against them in German universities, actually European universities. This uh, caused something to happen in the study of psychoanalysis that still exists to this day. If you are inclined to be a psychoanalyst, not only do you have to get your terminal academic degree in psychology or a related field, but then you need several years of training at a psychiatric institute, which typically are not ran by universities. Typically, these are standalone organizations. And to this day, there are still some of these centers to train psychoanalysts in L.A., San Francisco, New York, London, and other places. So... This is the beginning. We've kind of set the stage, set the environment that Freud lived and worked in. Now let's start looking at some of his ideas. This has been a We Have Couches video production, copyright 2020, Professor Michael Botwin, all rights reserved.